welcome all of you back to the second day of the conference, Acting As If on Prefiguration. This uh, panel now, which will go on until one o'clock, is on confronting the climate crisis. Uh, and um, you might have noticed if you saw an earlier version of the program that the program has slightly changed. We have two speakers now, Jakub Kowalewski and Peter Cox. And Jakub will be going first with a talk on reinterpreting Paulinian as if in the light of the climate apocalypse. Uh, she has used for the title as quote from Paul for the form of this world is passing away. Um, and Jakub Kowalewski, I'll just say uh, briefly, is uh, an associate lecturer at the University of Winchester and is editor of the Environmental Apocalypse Interdisciplinary Reflections on the Climate Crisis, which is forthcoming with Rutledge. I hope that's still an accurate timeline, forthcoming. Um, and is the author of uh, articles on the philosophy of history, medieval heretics, political ontology, and philosophy of literature. And he's currently working on a book on the phenomenology of self-awareness. And look forward to the talk. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much, um, Dan, for organizing and for you guys to turn up on Saturday. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just going to share my screen now, um, and then I'm going to start. I'm, I'm going to have a couple of slides, and I'm just going to talk over them. I apologize in advance if um, the talk is very abstract, but <laughs> my background is in philosophy. Uh, I know that many people might think that Philosophical thinking is not necessarily in line with, uh, you know, environment and climate apocalypse. But I hope to argue that maybe it's actually worth uh, having a theoretical uh, approach um, to think about what's happening uh, right now. So I wanted to start with basically a claim that might be obvious to all of you, but I think it's it's quite important to state it that um, apocalypticism used to be, I think, in the last kind of you know however many years seen as a sort of fringe thing, uh, you know, the kind of cult-like or uh, or perhaps um, you know, sectarian way of thinking. We kind of hear about cults that believe in the end of the world and so on, uh, or so small groups of uh, religious um, uh, religious extremists. But it seems like apocalypticism has become part and parcel of um, mainstream discourse. I did some, um, you can see some screenshots here from uh, very mainstream uh, uh, outlets, Wikipedia, uh, CNN, uh, Financial Times, The Guardian, all of them have been using the notion of the climate apocalypse as, as sort of um, part of their vocabulary. So I think based on this sort of uh, presence or, uh, or omnipresence rather of the climate apocalypse in contemporary discourse, I kind of wanted to suggest two hypotheses. I can't back them up here, but I'm happy to talk about it in the, um, in the Q&A. So the first hypothesis is that perhaps climate apocalypse no longer functions as a metaphor, uh, but rather as a concept uh, that captures our contemporary existential condition. There is something about our situation right now generated by the climate crisis that can be uh, quite clearly called apocalyptic, it's not, in a, not even in a sort of metaphorical sense anymore. That's my first hypothesis. And the second one, if this is the case, then I think our contemporary situation places us in, uh, in the, in the quite a long history of apocalyptic thinking. So I think that there is something important about um, thinking about our situation as not just this sort of completely uh, uh, unprecedented, but rather something that uh, repeats uh, apocalypticism, uh, which has happened throughout history. Very briefly, I wanted to define apocalypticism in a, in a, in a broadest sense possible, namely as a commitment to a belief that the world is ending, or this world is ending, and a new world is to come. Um, we can translate it in, in, into kind of modern language as saying this world is unsustainable and an alternative world is needed. And I think if we understand it that way, we can really see that it is something that seems to be kind of uh, uh, believed in at least or, or recognized by um, a lot of people, not just by fringes. Um, OK, so with that in mind, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the discourse on eco apocalypse um, can be categorized. So it seems to me that uh, a lot of people think about when the notion of eco apocalypse is sort of discussed, 
is very often is, uh, discussed as a, a type of an existential attitude. So what I mean by this is an attitude one has towards one's existence as a whole, um, which is articulated in relation to the world's end. So uh, when we think about eco-apocalyptic discourse in this way, we can differentiate these different um, existential attitudes we might have in relation to a temporal index, which thinks of the world as uh, of the end of the world, either in the past, something's already happened, in the future, uh, or in the present. Um, so, so basically we can be kind of pessimist, optimist, or realist, depending on uh, whether we think of the kind of um, catastrophic end of the world as something that has already happened, will happen, or is happening. Um, Delf Roth um, has a very good paper that maps uh, contemporary approaches to, to uh, eco-apocalypse to this kind of way of thinking about the end of the world temporally. Um, so I also think that it kind of commits us to a particular type of politics, right? So depending on whether, where we locate the end of the world, we have a uh, different type of politics that needs to deal with it. Um, so what I would like to suggest um, is a slightly different way of categorizing the eco-apocalyptic discourse, um, namely not in terms of time, but you might expect in terms of space uh, as the classic uh, opposition goes. Um, and so I would like to say that we should, one way to think about the eco-apocalyptic discourse is not so much about where we locate the end of the world, but rather where we position ourselves in relation to the ending world, right? So the sort of, uh, spatial uh, way of conceptualizing where we are in relation to the world um, can also help think about um, the sort of eco-apocalyptic discourse in general, but eco-apocalyptic politics in particular. So, um, as I mentioned, I do think that we can kind of think about today's situation as sort of placed within the context of the history of apocalypticism. And so um, I'm gonna turn to uh, a very famous passage from the first letter to Corinthians. Uh, uh, it's a Paul's letter um, and specifically two interpretations uh, suggested or put forward by Georgi Agamben and Jean-Luc Marion. Um, because I think that these are the two claims that I'm trying to kind of uh, defend or explore today. I think that the Agamben's and Marion's readings of Paul uh, illustrate two types of apocalyptism, which I believe is grounded in a process of distanti distanciation from ending world. In that Agamben and Marion allow us to think about apocalypticism as, as taking a distance from the ending world, so hence the spatial dimension, right, kind of taking a distance. And I also think that this taking a distance in Agamben and Marion leads to either individualistic politics or authoritarian politics of climate uh, so I'll speak about it more um, in a second. Now, the second claim I would, I would like to defend is that actually Agamben's and Marion's uh, readings offer resources to help us think about a third type of um, apocalyptic politics, neither individualistic nor authoritarian. Uh, and I call this sort of type of politics in and against the world, and I will sketch it, um, sketch it at the end of my talk. So basically what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about Paul, talk a little bit about Agamben, a little bit about Marion, and then suggest my alternative, or my alternative uh, to, to both uh, Marion and Agamben. And hopefully that will help us to, again, think about uh, the sort of environmental discourse that uses uh, this sort of notion of eco-apocalypse and thinks about our condition as apocalyptic. So here is the quote from Paul. Um, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short, from now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if they were not, uh, if it, it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. So the standard reading seems to be that uh, because the world in its present form is, um, uh, is ending or is passing away, we should not be committed to this world, Rush, rather we should live as if uh, while awaiting for the new world which is to come. So here the as if seems to be suggesting a process of distanciation, distanciating oneself from uh, the ending world and in so doing kind of preparing for the new world. And I think this sort of notion of distance is picked up by both Agamben and Marion in their readings of, of this passage. So Agamben actually decides to translate the as if as as not um, because he wants to emphasize that the uh, as not nullifies our worldly condition. 
the sake of time, I won't, won't read the quotes, but basically what for Agamben, uh, for Agamben, the idea is that um, as if um, names a sort of internal process in which our earthly vocations, earthly identities become nullified, and an internal distance is created between us and our worldly identity. Um, so the idea would be here, you know, like I'm a, you know, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm an academic, I'm a philosopher, but somehow living as if would create a distance between me and my worldly identities and, and nullify those worldly identities, create some sort of a space that wouldn't be occupied by these worldly identities. Um, and in so doing for Agamben, we kind of prepare for the end of the world um, in, in Paul. Uh, so I think that we can map that sort of way of thinking um, onto ecological discourse that seems to be occupied with um, individual ethical commitments and choices. So I think that there is something about this discourse that you know talks about uh, going green, becoming vegan, uh, cycling, uh, recycling, that seems to be about saying, look, we have to sort of separate or distantiate ourselves from our worldly identities and worldly practices, which uh, reproduce terrible things in the world, unsustainable things in the world. And in so doing, we can kind of prepare for um, a greener alternative world. Um, so of course, the, the re there's a recognition, I think, in this discourse that individual action is not sufficient uh, to bring about a new world. But there is something important about, um, about prefiguring this new world uh, in sort of creating a distance between uh, our contemporary uh, free practices uh, and by doing something different, it's something, um, something, something uh, more ethical um, in this context. So I think this, so we have this sort of one discourse, which is the sort of discourse where the end, the, 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 end, the end of the world is happening. And so we need to kind of turn inward, create alternatives, and this turn inward can kind of somehow prefigure a greener world. Um, Marion, on the other hand, uh, starts slight, with a slightly different uh, perspective. He, he wants to talk about uh, boredom and how we experience boredom. And so he has this idea that boredom, when we bored, we place the totality of the world in suspension, he calls it. What it means is that when we bored, the world itself as a whole becomes somehow insignificant to us. So the world as it is might as well not be. I think that's basically the kind of the primary uh, message of his uh, of Marion's account of boredom um, and so the idea here is basically that we conceive of the world as a totality and and we kind of as he puts it striking with a vanity right so all appears vain to us it's irrelevant to us as the world is or isn't in some ways um, but importantly for Marion to do that to place the world in this sort of um, oh by the way sorry I didn't mention this uh, this is all based around Marion's reading of Paul, uh, where he kind of takes on this idea of living as of, uh, you know, being married as if not being married and mourning as if not mourning, that both of those options basically um, uh, are equally irrelevant. Um, and so the world itself, he then kind of extrapolates and say the world itself is being or not being as the kind of fundamental options between the world are also irrelevant. Uh, importantly for Marion to, to be able to place the totality of the world in the sort of gaze of boredom and striking it, it, it with vanity, uh, we need to occupy a exterior position in the world. We need to have the sort of godlike perspective to conceive of the world as a whole. For Marion, that's important because uh, Marion believes that that sort of exteriority to the world places us closer to God and sort of points us towards God, the solution to the problem of, of the world being sort of insignificant. Uh, namely that it's through God that the world can kind of gain meaning again. And again, I think that um, Marion's politics, uh, sorry, Marion's uh, account uh, of apocalypticism seems to be kind of mapping onto this idea of thinking about the climate crisis as a, uh, in terms of big structural issues. Right? We kind of, um, again, take this sort of godlike perspective we look at the world and we notice all those terrible things that are happening, you know, global capitalism, Action of the planet, um, uh, nation states not being able to do anything, and so on and so forth. So we've got a sense of a totality of the world uh, being sort of impermanent. Um, but, and this is, I think, quite an ingenious idea that Marion puts forward, being in that position of seeing the world as a totality creates this sort of uh, uh, 
double feeling. So on the one hand, we find ourselves um, incapable or powerless to uh, do anything about it, right? So how can we deal with these massive global issues? How can we as individuals act on a global scale to bring the totality of the world? But on the other hand, uh, as Agamba, sorry, as Marion sort of um, points out, we can have this sort of turn to God, right? The turn to an authority figure, which is able to, has the power to do something about it. But I actually think that Marion conceptualizes something interesting, that when we have this sort of uh, total or global perspective, we have, because we feel powerless, we would then feel like we want to turn to a more power, powerful authority figures like governments and inter international institutions, which might be able to do something on a global scale. To kind of summarize, uh, I think this kind of apocalyptic politics of distanciation, as I call it, uh, lead to kind of individualism and authoritarianism. I think they're two sides of the same coin, because in both cases, what we have is a certain distance from the world. So we have here, with number two, we've got interiority, that's Agamben, right? So kind of distance from the world that is sort of ethical and, 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 and um, individual. But of course, we can't really do anything as individuals. So we can then occupy this sort of total uh, distance, the exteriority in Marion, which leads us to an authority figure, which then can do something about the world, right? So either way, what we find is that whether we think of the distance from the world as interior, or as a distance of the world or as exterior, we end up uh, with uh, politics which emphasize individuality or emphasize uh, authoritarian solutions. By authoritarian, of course, I'm, you know, it's a loaded term. I mean, authorities do things, but you know, it's an authoritarian solution in this way. Um, so I would like to very briefly uh, suggest a, uh, a third way of thinking about, um, uh, about um, uh, apocalyptic politics which doesn't require us to rely on this notion of a distance. Paul's letter uh, actually is, uh, um, or the passage taken from Paul's letter is taken from a context of a discussion of very worldly discussions about marriage, circumcision, the status of servants. Um, and so actually what I think Paul is doing there is commenting on something uh, that is firmly located in the kind of everyday existence of the Corinthian community. And so I think that there is something about important happening there about uh, being within the world and, and not dist distantiating oneself from the world. Um, so um, I actually think that there is a problem there, uh, namely that, um, thanks Joe, uh, namely that um, it seems to me um, that the, um, politics of kind of distanciation have an intuitive appeal because when we think about an alternative world, we think about, uh, you know, taking a distance from this world and that taking that distance allows us to then think of something, right? It's sort of like you're taking a step outwards or you're leaving something in order to create something new, right? That seems to be the kind of move that I think makes an intuitive appeal. However, if it is the case that um, uh, we, our apocalyptic thinking is located in the world, we kind of run into certain paradoxes and I think the main paradox seems to be that um, we seem to be simultaneously opposing an uns unsustainable world and rely on the unsustainable world for our existence, right? Because if we cannot really step outside of the world, we are necessarily kind of limited by it, but we nonetheless trying to kind of think of an alternative from within. Uh, and I actually found a, uh, a similar problem um, stated in the pamphlet or in the book in and against the state. Um, and so I, I steal this idea of in and against the world from that title, which I think nicely captures it. Um, and so the authors of that pamphlet say, the conservative government elected in the summer of 1979 is apparently attacking many aspects of the state, cutting state expenditure yet further, causing the loss of state jobs. This confuses many people who feel the need to defend the state, yet do not feel that it is their state and know that the state itself oppresses them. It's all the more urgent, therefore, that as socialists, we look for ways of fighting back efficiently rather than simply defending the state we know to be indefensible. So the point here is that um, the choice is not between taking a distance from the world um, and creating an alternative that way or uh, remaining in the world and defending something that is indefensible, uh, but rather of trying to remain within and create alternatives within. And I think what's really perceptive there in, in this pamphlet is this idea of opposition or antagonism as a sort of a driving um, a driving force. So because we can't, if we can't leave the world, we can only oppose it. 
um, uh, from within. I also feel that uh, we can use Agamben's and Marion's ideas to kind of articulate this there be feather if we displace them a little bit. So instead of thinking of Agamben's notion of nullification as a way of nullifying our earthly identities, uh, we can think about it as applying to the world and we can start thinking about the structures of the world itself as being uh, uh, as, as lending themselves to a nullification or a process of nullification. Um, so this is kind of captured by this notion of, of this quote from Paul, that the form of this world is passing away. In other words, the world ending world is contingent. There is something contingent about the structure of the world. So that would ground the possibility of opposing it. And with Marion, it seems like his idea of, of power seems to be very much exterior to the world. But I wonder if we can maybe again displace it and, and, and put it in the world and think of power as an immanent category. And so we are capable of living as if in the world because we, we have the power to enact the nullification of the structures of the world. I know this sounds very abstract, but to kind of very briefly uh, summarize what I'm trying to say is that I think that in, as well as having these two types of um, apocalyptic politics based around the distance from the world, uh, I think we can also put forward or try to articulate a third type of apocalyptic ecopolitics, which is based around uh, being within the world and against the world. Um, and so it would be an antagonistic politics. Uh, politics that would nullify the structures of the world and rely on an immanent power, um, and possibly not individualistic nor authoritarian, insofar as on my reading, these options seem to be posing a notion of distance which I'm trying to deny. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'm two minutes over, sorry. All right, thank you very much. Um, we started one minute late, so you're only one minute over. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. I have already a few questions that occur to me. Um, so I look forward to the discussion afterwards. But first, we will move on to Peter Cox, who is uh, who has a presentation that asks a question that uh, I ask myself wistfully every day. What if there were no cars? Connecting Cyclovia and COVID-19 lockdowns as prefigurative political mobility spaces for a degrowth world. And uh, Peter Cox is, if, uh, if uh, the information I have is correct, he is a professor of sociology at the University of Chester in the UK and chairs an uh, international network for, uh, called Cycle Scientists for Cycling and Sciences for Cycling for the European Cyclist Federations, I guess part of the broader federation. Um, and he's authored and co-edited uh, and edited a number of books on the sociology of cycling and, it's, and is currently working on a monograph on cycle activism as social movement. Now the floor is yours, Peter. Okay, is that working? Yep, brilliant. Okay, so not that's it. Um, so if we just to locate the paper to start, if we start with Matthias' succinct definition that prefigurations concerned with the embodiment of ideals within practices, then the central concern in my own studies has been the ways in which everyday mobility practices can be used to prefigure social and political alternatives. 40 years of reading anarchist works continues to engage my political imagination, but I'm finding that for practical purposes, that my primary focus has shifted from thinking of the state as the locus of power and, and the need for, its, uh, for, for it for, to challenge it, which means that anarchist politics has to be reshaped around the state, and to other, uh, other locations of power, and particularly going through Harvey, Soja, to Mimi Scheller's work on spatial politics. So the ways in which the use and governance of space determines our potentials for action and interaction. Um, and especially for Scheller's work on mobility justice, which considers not only the ways in which justice is spatially maldistributed, but also constituted through mobility. And so the recent work that I book I co-edited with Till Colin from Lunt, um, focus of the politics of cycling infrastructures, 
focuses precisely on which the spaces of mobility are political, and it considers the impact of the global hegemony of automobility over public space. So the power, the hegemonic power I'm looking at in public space is actually that of automobility. So it's been clear for many years that the current patterns of mobility, whether they're urban, suburban, peri-urban, rural, they're unsustainable. We move about in ways that are not compatible with uh, <coughs> decarbonisation. Uh, but those contemporary concerns with, with carbon intensity of transport are only a single, albeit crucial, part of a wider long-standing concerns with socially and environmentally destructive impacts of car domination. The negative impacts of mass motorization uh, needn't be rehearsed here. Uh, what's worth noting for today is simply the degree to which significant transformation of future mobilities is now an accepted feature of planned transformations to low carbon futures. Electrification of the vehicle fleet is required, but it's also, we have to acknowledge that it's only part of the solution. Transferring the energy value of current oil consumption into new, new uh, zero carbon or lower carbon energy electricity production and storage will require massive increases in capacity. And what we're doing at the moment is simply decarbonizing um, by substitution for existing oil and gas. So if the transport sector is electrified, demand will increase way beyond existing capacity. So planning for decarbonisation in the transport sector requires rethinking how and why everyday mobilities are performed. And this includes the de induced demand for mobility produced by our organisation of the spaces of work, the spaces of residence, and all understood as the sites of consumption as well as reproduction. So the background to all of this is that sustainable mobilities require not just decarbonisation, but degrowth if they're to address environmental and social dimensions of sustainability. And part of this process will necessarily come from reduction in the overall demand and practice of mobility. Movement, you can think of it in terms of the consumption of space. And so the first movement towards more sustainable mobility patterns has to be a move to reduce demand, not just supply in low carbon forms. So cycling has to be part of this, although it's not the whole picture. So early manifestations of concern about the social and environmental costs of road building promoted to both to supply and to create intense in increasing demand for transport could be seen in campaigns against road building in Northern Europe from 1970 onwards, especially visible were are high profile actions against the expansion of urban motorways in, for example, London, Paris, Amsterdam. The first wave of campaigning centered on the destruction of communities and social spaces, alongside the bulldozing of the, her the very heritage that defines urban place. The energy of crisis of late 73 gave another focus to activists who were further able to highlight the dependence of car mobilities on the oil economy also linking it to the environmental, environmental devastation wrought by recent oil spillages, receiving high media profiles in a newly televised era. Of course, you know, these retain their impact in, in black and white. The outcomes of these protests were limited. Specific programmes were halted or abandoned, but by and large, work to ensure more sustainable urban transport futures was sporadic piecemeal. New emphasis was placed on pedestrianisation of older um, city centres, sometimes with the revitalization or new development of metro systems and other mass transit modes. But overall, the major pattern was on finding ways to accommodate ever-growing motor traffic volumes, especially through provision of parking space, underground, multi-storey, as well as in any vacant building lot, so as to provide more urban space for cars. Now, this had the twin effect of enabling and normalizing car travel as the default mode. To put it, tech, to put it properly, it's, it, it reinforces and uh, emphasizes and reinforces the hegemonic um, role of the car in public space. Now, once entrenched, mobility patterns uh, 
self-replicate habituated patterns have effects not just economic but uh, personal and social other possibilities and ideas for old in <clears throat> the words of older members of community are just viewed as no nostalgia younger citizens struggle to imagine worlds they've never inhabited alternative arrangements are relegated to lost pasts inevitably erased by a linear path of time imbued with myths of progress. Alternative futures, therefore, lack any traction in the present that would make them more distant, make them more than distant and occluded thoughts. Modification and mild reform applied to the worst excesses appear as the only possible paths of change in this uh, set scenario. So the closure of political imaginations is both is a problematic as both definition and outcome of hegemony. The extent of car domination of public life is exposed in Ari's exploration of automobility as a system. But the other comment that Ari made was that this goes has largely gone unnoticed and un, unexamined. So the problem ceases to be just the car itself as an object or as traffic, but as a component of an entire system of capital reproduction and accumulation enacted in the occupation of space, physical space, economic space, political. On the transport sector have been piecemeal and ineffective. A couple of notable cases stand out for their reinstatement of alternatives to total concession to automobility, but even in Amsterdam and Copenhagen as the most notable example. Cycling remains a subordinate part of a mobility system oriented around motoring. Modernist erasure of the past in urban planning has been achieved without having to flatten and rebuild wholesale as the early 60s planning uh, dream put it. Instead, non-car spaces are preserved like reservations within colonial landscapes of automobility highlighting their non-conformity to the normal and proper mode of movement, impossible to scale up or survive without a hinterland of fully motorised traffic. So the two examples in, my, in the title, the Cyclovia and the Covid lockdowns, need some perhaps need a little explanation. The Cyclovia originated a, as counter visions of the right to the city, inspired not coincidentally by the stirrings of the reimagination of the 1960s. As Montero explains, Ciclovia events, these are events in which cities close their streets entirely to motor traffic for a temporary period, usually today once a, a day once a month. They trace their origins back to 1974. Using family and political connections, three activists launching a local bike organization managed to get permission from Bogota's transportation and planning departments to close to motorized traffic 80 blocks of the city's two main arteries. 5,000 people from a diversity of social groups attended this first experiment, which was repeated a year later. Subsequently, Ortiz, one of the initial activists was hired to advise the transports, a city's transport department. And these closures co continued intermittently over the next few years. 1983, Mayor Ocampo extended it to cover 54 kilometers of city streets, noting that the example had already been taken up in other cities. Unlike the political perspective of those initial actions, the city's vision was primarily recreational in theme and its scale shrank back to only 20 kilometers of closed streets by the early 90s. 1995 brought a, a new mayor in Mayor Mokos and renewed concern over public space, reflecting problems of urban violence, institutional dis distrust. Cyclovia were revitalized as a central component in a wide, wider focus on shared activity in public space. As the reach expanded to 120 kilometres of road closure with over a million participants, by the end of the 1990s, the focus returned to transport issues. Closures became a regular feature of city life. 
130 kilometers of cycle lanes, the largest bus rapid transit system in the world, the rebuilding of over a thousand public parks, witness the transformation of urban space and people's potential mobilities within it. Through deliberate action, Ciclovia were pr promoted globally, not only as addressing concerns about transport, but also as having potential impacts for public health. And often today promoted as best practice, What's perhaps more valuable are the changes occurring in urban and civic infrastructure subsequent to their implementation. By allowing public experience of city streets without cars, Ciclovia defray fears that city life will be impossible without the car. The connection of mobility and public health, moreover, indicates that transformation of mobility scapes is not just to do with transport, rather, it exposes transport's intersection with concerns over health related both to individual activity and reductions in air pollution. Concerns over public safety, concerns over accessibility of public space, livability, sociability and social inequalities are all shown up as inter, uh, intertwined with uh, transport practices. And competitive concerns by city authorities that they be seen to inter embrace international best practice produce unexpected collateral when the social spaces of the street are no longer colonised by the private spaces of the car. So over the course of several decades, Ciclovia projects have morphed from independent opposition to institutionalised civic projects and often back again. They've been presented as a through a range of thematic uh, stresses. But their significance here lies in the opportunity they give participants and planners to see potential car-free spaces in action, even if only for a limited time. Streetscapes can be reimagined, re not as an extra exercise in abstract thought, but physically incarnate. Stages for the performance of mobility practices and rituals impossible in the everyday. They allow the carnivalesque to erupt into otherwise dominated life spaces. So if we read Cyclovia through uh, Bakhtin, then the celebration of bodily movement on the streets through walking and cycling challenges and strips away the mask of power from the sacred spaces of automobility. To play in the streets is an act of profanity, a rejection of the norms of respect and pious supplication to automobilities. Sorry. So, but it's tempting, of course, to push this a little further. And if Cyclovia represent the carnivalesque dimension that allows imagination to run riot, to see power inverted, then the COVID-19 pandemic is akin to times of plague. The effect of lockdowns on spaces of mobility was profound and rapid. Mass closure of white collar employment centers stripped cities of their community populations. Streets emptied of pedestrians and traffic. Circulation rules varied between nations, but cities in much of Europe and North America became momentarily still silent. Taking necessary exercise, citizens emerged from isolation into transformed cityscapes to create space for physically distanced movement, whether as exercise for newly confined home workers or for those whose jobs are necessary to keep cities functioning and who lack the provision of the usual mass pack, packed mass transit services required for their rap, rapid intervention. Widened pedestrian provision, newly installed cycle lanes allowed for physically distanced mobilities. The decrease in urban motor traffic revealed how much everyday mobility, people, goods and services is a function of the spatial organization of labor the reproduction of capital being reliant on the concentration of space and mass movement of materials into and out of urban centres. Now, the easing of restrictions, the return of economic fu functions of urban life brought back motor traffic levels often higher than pre-lockdown. Yet the contrasts were clear. City dwellers had glimpsed a life without the noise pollution of constant traffic, of significant rapid improvements in air quality, just as significant were the individual perceptions of different arrangements of public and mobile life and the awareness of the rapidity with which transformation can be brought about. 
Shorn of the bureaucracy of committee process, streetscapes were remade, space reallocated with the speed of guerrilla act tactical urbanism. It was possible for spatial reallocation to be performed overnight through temporary barriers, planters, cones. Each street intervention gave those who saw it and used it a physical encounter with space transformed. Contrasting dramatically with the mass participation and carnivalesque dimensions of the Ciclovia, the mobility scapes of the COVID response nevertheless allowed a glimpse of a different way of ordering reality. Many objections to reallocations of urban road space arise from its comprehension as a, uh, or perception of it as a scarce commodity. Lockdowns revealed that the conditions of scarcity in city space arise from its appropriation by the car. Stripped of the apparently insatiable spatial demands of motor traffic, both in motion in its, and in the stasis of parking, there is sufficient urban space for it not to be no longer considered a, such a scarce resource. This change of perspective unleashes considerable potential for imagining new urban mobility configurations, no longer confined by the narrative that provides for automobility as the prime necessity, and leaves other forms of street life to contend for margins and leftovers. So in quite different ways, Ciclovia projects and urban mobility planning responses to the COVID pandemic provide prefigurative landscapes into which one can imagine radically altered mobile futures. Perhaps notable is that this is a prefigurative process not limited to small groups of experimenters. The drawback of small scale experimental projects is that they often remain elite, all right for sections of the community, but difficult to scale up. Instead, both of these examples for the reconfiguration of public space commence on a mass scale. Their limitation is temporal rather than spatial. Ciclovia projects only make sense when there is mass closure of road space, single street closures or an interlinked linear routing merely confine and channel alternative visions into narrow predefined spaces. Alternatives then are limited to those that can exist alongside current dominant practices without challenging them. In effect, the radical challenge and prefigurative dimensions are contained and pacified by predetermining their realm of possibility. Mass closure of road space opens an imaginative space curtailed only by the return to normal. When mass closure takes place, the visions that they allow uh, are shut down only when the normal conditions, in quotes, are of domination by automobility return. The temporary closure of life during lockdown interrupted normal mobile life in a very different way. Disruption to life brought a longing to return to sociality, to communication, to human interaction. Yet those spaces of interaction had been powerful, powerfully transformed. To indicate how normal processual automobilities impoverish urban life as much, for, they impoverish urban life for all as much as they facilitate it for some. Collective interaction in reclaimed city streets, even though physically distanced, offered a star vision starkly contrasting with the everyday of pre-pandemic life. So given the need for profound levels of decarbonisation in the transport sector and the impossibility of achieving this without using cycling as a major component of those changes, the practical lessons of these two processes are not limited to, the potential, to their potential as prefigurative imaginaries. From a mobility perspective, degrowth requires more than decarbonisation of transport. It also requires deep transformations of the spatial structures of economic reproduction that create dependency on ever increasing growth in, distance, growth in distances travelled by persons and goods. So reading both these examples through Eric Olin Wright's work to envision real utopias, they provide mechanisms of change. While much Emphasis under current arrangements is placed on the infrastructural need to provide for trans cycle transport in cities. These examples demonstrate that the most profound changes require little or no infrastructural adjustment, only the removal of motor traffic or its corralling within limits to specific times and places. <laughs> 
under the limitations of lockdown in Paris, we see the 15 minute city concept becoming practical and electoral sense. Localization of goods and services restructures their delivery and accessibility. Minimizing the overall mobility demand is the shortest way to deliver low carbon solutions. And as a final reflection, the first generation of activists challenging motor dominance grew up in cityscapes where low levels of motor traffic were part of living memory. They fought against the growing encroachment on their sense of the city as commons. Now, few of today's activists have experienced cities without motor traffic. But both these examples discussed provide glimpses into a world that could be, not back to a world that once was. Confined to the past and memories of the past, political imagination becomes nostalgia, untrustworthy romanticization of a mythic once was. As nostalgia, the perfect past obscures its inequalities and injustices. Projected into the future without grounding in actual experience, the prefigurative imagi political imagination is equally suspect, risking totalitarian demands for obedience to a closed vision or drifting, alternatively, drifting into nebulous speculation, supported as only dream worlds without any political grounding. Mass inhibition of automotive traffic operationalizes change. These examples ground a prefigurative political imagination for sustainable mobility futures and simul simultaneously provide a collectively visible goal. There's an important difference between the projection of a planner's tele teleological dream to be imposed upon the populace and the presentation of an open and negotiable set of possibilities towards which shared, towards which shared journeys can be made. A more desirable and sustainable situation can be experienced and then used for backcasting. Through collective and shared experience, we develop the basic principles of the place we need to get to. This allows us to identify appropriate steps that need to be taken individually and collectively and to move towards it. These prefigurations are necessarily imperfect. Within such spaces, physical and temporal spaces, existing inequalities and injustices can be exposed analyzed and addressed. Solutions aren't projected for future resolution, but become a necessary part of the current processes set in train by the mobility imaginaries unlocked by these experimental presents. This analysis doesn't hope for or anticipate further pandemic lockdowns, but perhaps Ciclovia projects might expand to incorporate the scale and potential for more rapid and permanent changes that have been made visible under the COVID-19 mobility responses. Thank you. I shall shut up there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, thanks to both of the presenters. And now we'll open up space for questions and comments. So either raise your hand or write something in chat if you if you have something to say. Okay, I see Dave Webb. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, thanks both both of the speakers. Um, that was um, extremely lucid, and it made me think about. Um, I regularly nearly get knocked down on my journey to, journey to work, and that's because of the way in which uh, cycle lanes have been um, relegated to a kind of a car-based, car-dominant uh, road system. Um, so it made me think about that in a new way. So thank you. I mean, my question was really around under COVID lockdowns, the temporary changes that happened to streets were driven by the state. Whereas your uh, historical look was talking about Cyclovia, where it was movements that were driving um, temporary or physical alterations to streets, and isn't there a isn't there, isn't that quite a stark difference? And, and to what extent does that difference play out in the um, 
the durability of those changes? Yeah, it's it, it's a really interesting dynamic because while the cyclovia start as movement initiatives, they're always implemented in particip- in, in in cooperation and with the state because the state is the controlling factor in infrastructure in 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 public in city space (laughs) so it's so it's kind of and i wanted to try and bring out the way that cyclovia have had a changing multiple relationships with the state the state has taken over and then used them for one thing and then they've been brought back in the lockdowns when you go through and break down what's been uh where uh, changes were made in lock in in covid lockdowns the core thing was that if if you do a large scale analysis and some colleagues have, have have done this if you do a large scale of analysis of what's been put in they go in and things happened where there were already activist groups on the ground saying this is what we need and many uh, many cities just turn say you, what do we? What is it? <laughs> oh, you oh, presented these plans, right? We can put them in now. Bang! So they happen not because of the they're implemented by the by the state, but they're in the initiative and the drive has come from uh, from citizenry. So it's so there's this weird dynamic that's going on in which the state responds to prior pressure. If you've got no prior pressure, nothing happens. Uh, and, and, and so, so, so there's a very interesting dynamic going on there. That's what I'd say. I, I find it also very interesting that comparing different kinds of prefiguration, uh, prefiguration related to transportation can't simply be local. You can't just do it in one building or one spot. It has to be, has to engage with large spaces and. Um, so it's it's an interesting question. Uh, but uh, Jakub, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Actually, it was uh, related to um, Dave's Dave's point. Um, I was also thinking about this sort of uh, state versus movement relation. Um, so Peter, I, I kind of wonder, I, mean, I frame it slightly different. It's a similar question, but I try to frame it slightly differently. Um, uh, it seems like you kind of were mapping um, the kind of types of, uh, you know, uh, street takeover um, as one is sort of like carnivalesque and, and impermanent uh, and that's the sort of um, uh, one coming from the bottom from the activist and so on and then the other one was sort of the state imposed one which has sort of more of a permanent sense right that there is this moment to become permanent so I kind of wonder if, if those sort of a, this sort of identity between sort of um, carnivalesque and impermanence coming from the bottom and permanence coming from the top, if that's necessarily the case, or are there any situations or cases or whether you can maybe envisage some situations where uh, there is a possibility of, of having permanent spaces that, that kind of are created this way, but without there being that sort of intervention from the top. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I would, I would, I would hesitate actually in that characterization of the cyclovia as being from the bottom up, um, because much of much of what was done, the revitalization of public parks, the um, the provision of new infrastructure is all state operated. They are sponsored by uh, by the state and and often often in conjunction with with, with private uh, enterprise as well. So there's there's public private capital going in to enable these things to happen, which is. You know, so it's a very peculiar dynamic, and it's why I kind of wanted to preface it. My my interest is not so much, well, is it the state or the people, as if they're two separate things, but where and how is power played out? And looking just at the at the at the at the power the the play of power in public space that is that then frames change in one direction or another, and so the dynamic of creating public space which is empowering not disempowering 
for the majority, which is about the deep, you know, breaking the colonial stranglehold of, of, of motor traffic, comes both ways. So tactical urbanism, where people had gone out and sketched in, um, a, a, even before lockdowns, you know, go out, you need a lane, you go out and paint the bloody thing. Um, pardon my language. Um, and then states often kind of like, oh, oh, there is a need. Right. Well, we've got more permanent paint. <laughs> and so, so, so there's another, that's another spin on that, on that process that much of the ac active or much of the dynamic of uh, lo authorities, um, local authorities in position of cycle late, new cycle lanes and pedestrian spaces in lockdown was actually just the making permanent of changes that had already been pushed for and, and partially put in place by, uh, by, by grassroots uh, groups. So there's a very, very odd dynamic going on there in both of them. If I can just uh, complicate the dynamic even more, I mean, there, another thing that goes on is that you have urban planners who often are very much aware that we need to decrease automobility and improve public transit and bike lanes and so on. And they will come up with plans behind closed doors sometimes. And then you have a kind of mobilization, so to speak, of the car owners who speak in the name of the of the ordinary people to demand their parking spaces and their and their lanes and, and so on. Um, it, it puts, I, I mean, I think uh, very good arguments can be made for why bicycles and public transportation are in the interest of everyone much more than cars. But it does make it does put activists in an interesting position when, especially in places where the average working class person has been forced by circumstances to drive to work. And uh, yes, or feel that they've been forced to, even if it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, um, you know, uh, it's it's one of those kind of kind of things. Well, I have to drive. So if you're blind. You don't drive, you know, that doesn't mean you stop living or you never you can't live anywhere but a city centre with perfect public transport. This is just, you know, it's these are these are the myths, uh, the myths of public life um, in one sense, in terms of kind of the, the these various discourses. Can I can I shift away a little bit? Um, and it, to ask a question on this one, though. Uh, yeah, you had your hand up before, so I wasn't sure if that was separate. Yeah, yeah, or... yeah. It was, okay. it, it was, yeah. It, it was to to ask of of Jacob, and I, I think I were actually moving around to it in terms of kind of the planners, the authorities, that dependence on authority figures, and I'm wondering if the prefiguration requires antagonism, and I thought that was really, really helpful. But where I'm kind of thinking is that. The missing part of is there a missing part of the conversation in how finding a location in relation to the world and the world that is currently ending in that the narratives of the apocalypse are also tied in to the concept of messianism. And I'm thinking there because. If we, if you, if you, if you step sideways and look at Walter Benjamin's um, concept, work on the concept of history, then that would it would make it a lot more complicated. <laughs> but I think it'd be a re really great extra chapter. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, is it the case that the sort of notion of antagonism, as I introduced it, seems quite abstract and it has to be sort of localized more clearly um, uh, and and localized more clearly in 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 view of messianism, is that correct? Um, well, I well I don't know because where you position yourself in terms of the relation of history, mm -hmm. I suppose, or the, or the apocalypse, in, in in theological terms, also it is a product of the where the messiah, the, that that redemptive agency has been, and mm -hmm. so wh who and where is the redemptive agency in this <laughs> in this narrative that allows you to place yourself either within the the Christian tradition or the Jewish tradition. <laughs> yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, I mean, I, I, um, 
I have been thinking about it in terms of how how within the sort of messianic or apocalyptic tradition, there are those privileged spaces, right? That seem to be kind of where this is where you kind of await this mm. to happen. You should. I mean, I was doing some work on uh, the Hussites in, uh, well, in medieval Bohemia and how um, they would go to mountaintops, and mountaintops were the place where places where something privileged would happen from a perspective. So I think you're right that there is something about where to place this agency. Um, now, this is, uh, I mean, I kind of took it very broadly, but I think, I mean, I kind of see this particular stuff about uh, distanciation as, as uh, following on from some work that I've done on um, the temporal aspect of, of apocalypticism. And what I'm trying to argue is that actually it's a mistake to think of um, apocalypticism today as uh, concerned only with one end. Uh, so we should think of the ends as sort of being distributed uh, across, right? So we can think of um, an end that is to come, an end that is happening, ends that are happening now, and ends that happened before. I mean, there is, Vieros de Castro has this uh, really good uh, point about how, you know, the main the extinction event happened already, and it was in 1492 uh, when Columbus arrived in, in, um, in America, and then the extinction happened there, right? So there's a sense in which the ends should be distributed temporarily across the timeline. And this distribution also implies a redistribution of different sort of agencies of privileged places. Since the ends are multiple, the places where the sort of, I like what you said, the messianic agency, I like, I like the way you put it, is distributed also sort of multiple and different. So I think, um, I mean, I didn't speak about it, but it's of course, there is a sense of sort of if the ends are multiple, the decentering is also multiple, or the kind of lines of antagonism are also multiple, and they have to come from different sides, uh, precisely because of the sort of multiplicity of, of apocalypses, rather than just one linear apocalypse leading to I don't know uh, space in Jerusalem for the mountain top in Bohemia. Um, so I, that is that making sense? What I'm saying here? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Now there was one comment on chat, and I and Dan has his hand up. Um, Dan, were you going to comment on Jakub or on on Peter's presentation? Um, I suppose. Oh, sorry, my video is off. Um, I so sort of both, probably slightly more to Jakub, but I, I would be. But All right, so let's stay on on Jakub's topic before going back. Uh, okay. Okay. okay so, so it's a bit of a. Yeah, if it's a bit open ended, it might not even be a question at all. But I was thinking about um, thinking about both actually both of your papers in relationship to the some of the discussion yesterday um, about uh, about withdrawal. And one of the things that that came up yesterday, and and I, Matthijs, I think asked the question very directly, is why do we associate prefiguration with withdrawal? With this question of like pulling out of the um, stepping back or pulling out of the moment. Um, of, of the system and then doing something else or or maintaining antagonism with it, but from a kind of outside point of view. And I thought what was interesting about both both of your papers is 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 a sense that maybe we're out we're, we don't need to step outside because we're pushed outside, right? Either by the apocalypse or by the um, the by COVID lockdown or by other moments where you know we we. There, so 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 I wondered if you you ha really had any thoughts about how that um, how that changes how we think about that idea of withdrawal because if we maybe it's maybe part of the problem is to start thinking that the withdrawal is something we get to choose or we get to engage in rather than that, that there are just these moments where we get kind of pushed out and then and then we have to act against and 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 maybe in and against at the same time but uh, but yeah so. I know, don't know if it's really a question, but I'm interested in you have, if you have thoughts about that, either of you. Um, Peter, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd go straight to Bell Hooks on this one and her, her essays on, on, on marginality. And because she talks about kind of the, the, the collective experience of being pushed to the margins of the city, and the view from the margins being both exclusionary and uh, and oppressive, but also a, a point of revolutionary change, and it, and in street spaces being pushed to the margins of the flow, um, 
uh, and uh, and and phys- phys- just the physical marginalization does i think create a perspective that were that both is an experience of 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 a form of oppression but is also a, a, an enlightened uh, pers- uh, an united space from which to view the uh, that which flows past and that which is facilitated and that which is de defacilitated um looking struggling for a word there um so i think it, it, about that that sense of speaking from the margin so the so the option is not to withdraw to withdraw is to uh, is to accede defeat that it is about that antagonism that fighting but fighting from the margins and not saying oh look i've got to find a better place or we've got to take over the center we don't want a road with margins and centers <laughs> so so it's a, so it's a there is a transformative process going pr- process going on in there jakob yeah, so actually, uh, I, I kind of, I, I kind of want to explore a little bit um, the opposite view that we want to take over the center, <laughs> and uh, and I was kind of thinking about about it in the context of, um, uh, so so I was basically thinking about what will happen, how do, can we think about prefiguration if we abandon this idea of withdrawal, or abandon this idea of the outside or of being pushed away, right? Like just as a kind of intellectual thought experiment, what happens if can we think about it without um, being kind of having that inside outside structure that we are from the outside and then we do things and the reason i mean i've got fairly i guess personal reasons why i wanted to do that it seems that one of the arguments i think seems to be wherever you kind of talk about slightly more radical politics to people who might not be invested in radical political projects like oh if you're so you know radical why don't you just like leave the city and live in a forest you know that kind of classic I don't know, I can just imagine a family member saying this sort of stuff and it's like, oh, come on, it's just... But anyway, so I was thinking, okay, so how would I, to this imaginary person who also assumes that uh, successful polit- radical politics requires this withdrawal, how would I respond to them and, and, and actually kind of do this? So I was sort of thinking about it as a, as a way of reclaiming space from within, um, basically. So, so instead of withdrawing and that withdrawal providing some sort of a respite or some sort of a way, of a way to regroup and attack um, to rather reclaim spaces, right? Because I, I think Joey mentioned squats, squats, right? Um, squats seems to be an interesting thing because there is on the one hand, of course, it's a creation of a space outside as it were, in terms of, you know, there's different stuff happening there that everyone else on the squad, uh, outside of the squad, but really is a reclaiming of a space that previously was sort of part of, um, of the center. So I was thinking more of as, as a sort of like a, uh, moving forward rather than a sort of withdrawal backwards, if that makes sense. Um, sorry if it's all very metaphorical, but it seems to me that if we if we kind of conceptualize it that way, I think we can we can kind of not necessarily think about withdrawal, but think about something that is sort of happening more actively and, and as a as a taking over. You want to quickly respond, Peter? Yeah, well, I was going to bring in Dave Webb's question, which is on the chat, because I think this speaks to it, it, it immensely. One of the D- debates and things I get I have to go and uh, deal with is uh, that sense in which some experience um, oh look these changes have come uh, are outsiders needs when actually they're not they're the changes that have been articulated by members of that community who've just been silenced for the past 25 years um, and so, so, so there's a there's a there's a very strange dynamic going on there. That um, oh look, you know, this is imported needs. No, these are needs. These are plans that were actually voiced by people in your community, but that you as driver have just never heard <laughs> because you've run the buggers over <laughs> so many times. <laughs> uh, and so, so there's. There's a really interesting dynamic, certainly in the UK, around those uh, around those uh, uh, the um, locked, lock, uh, lockdown um, uh, cycle uh, cycle lanes, which is why the oddly central government um, has just done this very very strange thing that. You know, Councils you know, are not allowed to take them back unless they can prove that they are a problem, because 
precisely be, uh, and the background thinking is precisely because actually these are not a, these are not an external ep- imposition of a better city plan they're actually the people who are, who are there who are already marginalized speaking out about their marginalization um and it's yeah data evidence I, that's that's all i say. <laughs> that's all i'll say go go do the ethnography and come uh, come back and, ref- and, and refute us <laughs> so um. uh, i just wanted to ask uh, georgiana if if she wanted to add anything to the comment she wrote um on the chat a bit earlier which is on this topic of planners and and whether they uh, what breed of planners we're dealing with at a certain moment uh if not i'll just uh i'll just quickly read it as someone working to promote public spaces that support an active and enriching public life i've always run into conflicts with traffic engineers when trying to pedestrianize roads or promote public spaces and such. There are quite many breeds of planners and many types of actors, cultures, and landscapes, depending on localities and geographies and local traditions, which is definitely something I've run into living, having lived in the United States and then in Prague, where uh, in the US it's often, the automobilization is often pushed by the cities before drivers themselves have a say in Prague, it's sometimes the drivers who push back and demand that the urban plans get changed or don't change so that they can still drive as much as they always wanted to. Um, and then, uh, so if Georgiana doesn't have anything to add, uh, Dave, did you want to add anything to your question and, and Peter's response? Um, I mean, I could come come back on what Peter was saying um, <laughs> just from, I mean, it's, it's a parochial e- experience of essentially the UK, centralised UK state and the way things are done in the UK, um, you, you know, uh, which tends to mean that whatever initiative is going, which, uh, which is on the table at that point in time, whether it's transport or whatever, it's, it's framed and, 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 directed by a set of concerns, usually down in London. And it's not always the case. I mean, you may, for example, um, have a, a neighborhood in somewhere in, in London, which is overwhelmed by traffic. And the top concern for that neighborhood is reconfiguring its streets and promoting cycling and walking. And, and, and it probably has disproportionate power over the framing of government policy agendas relative to neighborhoods in the north which have different concerns and are not so overwhelmed by traffic and um, not such high car ownership not such cultures of cycle use or environmental activism so in those I've I've just witnessed the pro cycling agenda being inflicted on neighborhoods not that they're against it but it's not necessarily the main thing that people are concerned with or or, or the thing that would most effectively trigger some sort of transition within those neighborhoods. Uh, I know, Jakub, you had your hand up, but uh, uh, M. Wilson I, has uh, not spoken yet. Um, I don't see your first name written there, but uh, if you want to ask your question, make your comment. Yeah, sorry, it's Matt. Someone's going to have to tell me at some point how I, how I changed my... My name. Um, I, it was, uh, I suppose, kind of a bit of a muddy reflection, and maybe, maybe a question. Um, I don't know if either of you were in my, my talk, the talk that I, I gave th- this morning. Um, I talked about liberalism and and the kind of the exclusionary um, politics or the the kind of exclusionary logics of liberalism, and I talked about veganism as an example, um, but f- certainly. Um, Cycling, um, I talk about in 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 my book as and I use use cycling as as an example of that kind of that kind of discourse and and the way that power kind of um, creates um, a kind of normalized world and then a, a, a kind of privatized world. Um, so yeah, the, a lot of what you said has resonated with me, and I've 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 
cycle campaigning has big, been a big kind of part of my life in, in the past. Um, I just wondered whether um, you see parallels with the way cyclists are excluded and the way the car is normalised um, and cyclists are presented as a kind of special interest, making demands uh, against this kind of normal um, normal world of the car driver, whether you see parallels with that discourse and other marginalised groups um, or political positions, whether you kind of see that in terms of a, you know, indicative of a broader p- political position or whether you're kind of more in- interested just in, in the kind of specifics of, of, the, of the sociologies of, of transport. Jakub, was there a question on this topic or should we let Peter respond first? Uh, it was, well, I mean, uh, Peter can respond it was, uh, also to Peter, so I think it's a bit different. So. Okay. Yeah, there is, I think there is the, the, that whole issue of, uh, of the kind of, the, 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 the processes of, of politicization are hugely, hugely varied. Um, but there is a, there, there is a, I suppose, yeah, there is a preponderance of the groups that I've been working with over, I suppose, past 25 years um, towards a, a skepticism toward to, to, to liberal um to the liberal state because i think because there's awareness even even those who 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 whose politics wouldn't want to rock the boat a recognition that the if the state is a machine for provisioning its citizens then it is a state that is never capable of provisioning sufficiently and equally to all its citizens so therefore it's always about uh, the partial distribution of social goods in which case there is a that does create a a particular political dynamic that that challenges the the logic of, of, of the state as a kind of Oh, it's just about tweaking to, to, to tweaking a policy, and then everything everything will be happy again. It's there. There is a gr- greater awareness, I think, that that springs out. So I think yes, there is a a politics, but it's not it's not kind of there's no linear causality between experiences of experiences of of riding and being and and forms of politicization. If that was what you were getting at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maybe I would add that there is this interesting, well, interest, there's this uh, situation in which those who are not drivers include both the most marginalized people and some people who are at least seen as elites by the say, middle class drivers. Um, not an uncommon political situation, but it, it creates a complicated situation for activism. Uh, but uh, Jakob? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, Peter, I, I really, really liked um, uh, your bringing up of Bakhtin. I thought that was a, uh, was a great one. So I think I actually have more of a comment than a question, sorry. But I, I was basically thinking that uh, what I really liked about this Bakhtin stuff was that it seems to me that the discourse around um, cycling uh, in the city seems to be very much about sort of cutting down, decreasing, um lowering limiting and so it's very much like a kind of like a you know um a language of 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 taking something away perhaps uh, and i and i wonder whether this kind of carnivalesque approach of bakhtin has this um more excessive a possibility for a more more excessive framing sort of framing not as as not as taking but as as giving something right because there's something about the carnivalesque situation of the regular that is sort of 
uh, yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the sort of possibility of framing this discussion about, um, well, then decarbonizing seems to be a kind of, you know, it's already D, so it's already taking, but like framing that sort of stuff in terms of more of an excessive thing and, and, and not a faith. Yeah. Uh, it's something I'm working on with um, Justin Spinney, who's got a brilliant book, the name of which has just escaped me, um, th that's kind of pointing out that the, oh, there's an almost, uh, in, in Harvey's terms, you know, cycling is just used as a fix to, to solve particular problems. But once you're moving, once you are, you have a form of zero carbon activity or something that some something that's not really heavy space demand is a convivial technology in illich terms um then what happens because the use to excess is no longer kind of except the 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 destructive excess and so and, and so it creates it creates a different form of surplus. One is that is not a, that um, that cannot be accumulated in the same way. And the but even the excess that it creates is self-limiting because it is about the it is ultimately about the human body. And so there's this is where we're kind of trying to trying to look at. Um, if we're going to talk about degrowths, I would prefer to talk about decroissance, the, to, to, to challenge this utility, what ends up as a kind of utilitarian debate about, ah, oh, we must decarbonize and uh, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and this means kind of the, a, um, a, an, almost, uh, an almost puritanical observance and saying that austerity was was not about taking shit away <laughs> originally in the in the in the in the in the, uh, in, in the monastic tradition austerity is actually just ensuring that everybody gets enough and and an austere everyday life is absolutely reproducible only because it is punctuated by the carnival it's punctuated constantly by the feasting and that feasting and fasting are just two sides like sun coming up sun going down and uh, an understanding that 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 balance which is then non-accumulative it's not it's not tied into the kind of modern growth economy or this myth of progress which is why I kind of wanted to start with Benjamin asking you about how this works, that there's something, there's something deep, I, that I think has deep possibilities, but I'm only just beginning to, 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 to tear the skin off it uh, and find out what's, what might be there in terms of that uh, celebration, uh, celebration of excess without accumulation. Um, same goes for, 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 thinking it through a kind of uh, a twisted version of thinking through work and labor that this that to to, to labor for your own movement whether you're walking or cycling or uh, skateboarding or whatever it is that's requiring your own move your own energies this is none this is work in straightforward terms but it's an unalienated form of work because you're not separated from its product ever <laughs> the product is there in the movement that does it so you know it's it so it it, it becomes work as play playing with uh, playing with others playing with children becomes a it, it's not a labor but it is work but it is work that is unalienated and therefore we need to kind of maybe have a maybe slight start exploring those languages slightly differently. Now, in the time we have left, uh, I've actually been waiting for a chance to get back to Apocalypse. And I had a, a question for Jakub about, about Paul's understanding and how it, how it can be mapped on or, 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 or how we can shift our own understanding of, of this Apocalypse and, and the as if. Because um, you know, in my reading of Paul, he, he, well, he takes 
he institutes a pretty strict distinction between the spiritual realm and the secular realm. And so uh, the, one way of reading this passage uh, would, would be to say, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like rendering to Caesar his due and rendering to God his due. So in, we're saying that like all of this secular stuff is irrelevant and in the spiritual realm, there's going to be an apocalypse. And so this world is passing away. So if we're, we should pay, when we're talking about spiritual things, we, we should ignore the other stuff. But it sort of takes for granted that in, in our secular lives, we still are going to be married and still will have property and still will do things as before, uh, at least in that reading. Um, so which is not the case for the environmental apocalypse the way most of us understand it. I mean, we, we can't just say it's happening in one realm and not, you know, not in our other everyday realm. So how do we, how do we, how do we grapple with this in, in our understanding of apocalypse today? Again, but maintaining this, this uh, ambivalence that the apocalyptic tradition sees apocalypse not only as catastrophe, but also as the coming moment of possible redemption. So, um, okay, so it's like three points. So, so the first point I wanted to make uh, is that, uh, sorry, three answers that I'll give. So the first one is um, that it seems to me that with Paul, uh, there is a interesting thing that happens where I think he takes very seriously the second coming of Christ um, and really believes that it's going to happen very soon. When it's not happening, he then starts coming up with this sort of theology of internal um, internalizing. Jakob Taubes is a great thinker for this. Uh, Jakob Taubes, in his reading of Paul, emphasizes how messianic movements have this tendency to have this very straightforward theology. Okay, the end of the world is coming, the Messiah is coming, just wait a little bit. It doesn't work, and then they try to come up with a more complex theological take, which seems to be justifying why this is not happening, and very often it's a move inward, and it's a, a sort of move, of like, so let's talk about it in spiritual terms, or of a spiritual thing that we are awaiting in the next kingdom. That's taken, I think, very seriously in, in Augustine, with these two kingdoms, kingdom of God and, 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 and the, or the heavenly kingdom and the city of God and the, and, and the human city. Uh, so I think, I think what happens in Paul is there, there is a tension between these two moments. And it's a tension proper, I think, to uh, messianic movements that are awaiting the Messiah, but where the Messiah doesn't come or if something happens. Uh, uh, and so I think you can emphasize one or the other aspect, depending on what sort of um, what you want to get out of Paul. I think <laughs> that's basically it. So if you try take it instrumentally, so, so basically, so the first part of your question, I would say that um, the spiritual and the worldly is obviously there, but we can see it as a response to a particular empirical problem, namely that the end of the world is not happening. Uh, but there is also this other pole where this empirical problem doesn't show up yet. Uh, and the, re the end of the world is very much a real possibility, um, in which case it sort of seems to be a slightly, a slightly different question. And there is a way of reading Corinthians, and that's the second part of my answer, where if you, if you look at the Corinthians, the language that is used is very, very carnal, it's all about the body, and particularly in the body, and about bodily things. So it seems that even if Paul operates with the Romans, for instance, letter to the Romans, with this worldly and, and spiritual distinctions, in the Corinthians, it's, it seems to be very much sort of body-oriented stuff. Uh, it could be because of the Corinthians and the community that was there, um, but it seems very much like it's it's related to the material um, sphere. So, and I think so that kind of illustrates, I think, that Paul, who's concerned with the now and not with the spiritual realm. Uh, uh, so that's that's my reading, at least. And of course, I'm not a Paul scholar. I mean, this is uh, this interpretation suggested to me by somebody else, actually. So, but I think there is something. To um, and how that relates to this sort of apocalypticism today, um, uh, well, it seems to me that in a very basic way, um, it's not the case that we can have a sort of apocalypticism that requires this sort of internal withdrawal from the world, um, or we abandon apocalypticism altogether. I think what's really interesting to me is about the possibility of apocalypticism, as I said, that is firmly located in the world doesn't require a withdrawal from the world. So it, 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 I think this other poll maps 
onto a possibility of thinking about, not just about apocalypse as being outside of the world and non-apocalypse as being in the world, but as apocalypse within the world. And, and I think that very nicely captures, I think, what's happening with, with the climate crisis, where there is a sort of element and the possibility of messianism that doesn't necessarily have to require a withdrawal or some sort of exterior space, but perhaps something imminent. Um, so that's how I view it, and that's why I kind of spoke about it. Well, thank you very much, and I guess we're ending right on time. So thank you to both of the speakers. Thanks for everyone who who came. And um, I don't know, if, Dan, do you have any organizational comments? No, I don't think so. Next session in, in an hour, exactly. So that's all. All right. OK, so uh, have a good lunch then. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.